Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. And uh, 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 this session, we have Kenneth and Matthew. And they're going to talk about two approaches for web services. Uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and welcome to our talk. Um, we're going to be doing a talk on two approaches to Python web services. Um, this is actually going to be quite simple. Um, in many ways, we're actually approaching this from uh, why you would do the two approaches to web. Oh, excuse me. Why you would be doing the. Can we have the microphone? That's number two. I'm number one. I'm number two. Can you hear me? Set. Perfect. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. That was horrible. <laughs> really not nice. <laughs> okay. Sure. Anything else? Can I continue? Okay, wonderful. Uh, yeah, so we're doing two approaches to Python web services. Um, we're going to approach this from the uh, point of view of why you would uh, be using two different uh, approaches instead of uh, the actual um, technicals, although we are going to go over some technicals as well. Um, but uh, okay. Continue. Switching it off, because. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, must I continue? Okay, cool. Um, so yes, we just approaching it from the point of view of uh, why you would use the two different web services. Um, my my name is Ken, and this is my colleague Matt. We work at a company called FIS. Um, FIS is a financial services uh, company, um, a, f a financial services technology company. Um, it actually turned 50 this, uh, this week, and uh, our CEO rang the um, bell to the New York Stock Exchange in uh, commemoration, so it was very nice. Um, anyway, so what does FIS do? Um, we are a financial services technology company, and we cover the breadth of the financial services industry. So we go from all technology dealing with retail and institutional banking, so that's ATMs and, uh, and all that type of stuff. And uh, we do payments, uh, payment solutions, asset and wealth management, which is the space that myself and Matthew are in, um, trading systems, risk and compliance, uh, so that's uh, risk, risk, uh, risk systems, um, and we also do consulting and outsourcing solutions. So we actually, Matthew and I are in the trading solution, uh, trading solution space, but we do consulting on the trading solution, uh, uh, on on the trading solution that FIS uh, provides. Um, FIS is a, a company that serves more than 20,000 clients uh, in over 130 countries. So as you can tell, it's a massive company. It really is a massive company. It employs more than 50,000 people worldwide. It's got offices everywhere, and uh, it's quite large. The reason why I'm emphasizing large is because that will be a theme <laughs> later on in the presentation. Um, again, it's a huge company, Fortune 500, and, uh, um, and it's, 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 it's up there. Um, one of the products that uh, FIS offers is a, a uh, a system called Front Arena. Now, Front Arena is a trading system, um, and it uh, and it uh, manages all electronic trading and position management across all asset classes. So that's what we do. We, I'm a financial engineer. Matthew is more of a developer, but I do do a little bit of development here, here and there, and uh, this is why we came to speak here. <laughs> um, anyway, so the reason why um, Python is involved in this whole matter is because together with Frontarena, Python allows FIS to offer flexible and customizable solutions to our customers. Okay, 
So that is why we are doing this. Uh, that is how Python is involved in, uh, in, in Front Arena. So we have to provide solutions to our clients and uh, Python is heavily, uh, is a tool with which we, um, we provide those solutions. So Matthew will be talking about the web service part of, uh, of our presentation. All right, so what are web services? Well, actually, I expect most of you to already know. This is for the two of you in the audience who don't know this, for whatever reason. Um, well, web services, what are they? No, services on the web. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Well, what does that really mean? Okay, so to understand, let's rather go back to the beginning, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, when we had uh, PCs with 640K of memory, 10 megabyte hard drives, and 2,400 board modems. Uh, and for the kids among you, 2,400 boards means 240 bytes a second. You could actually read stuff as it passed across the screen. Uh, this is not something we have to deal with anymore. Thank goodness. Yeah. But back then, any communication between computers was quite hard. You had to be very efficient about how you transmitted data. And to be honest, a lot of time it wasn't worth it because you couldn't really network with other people. Back then, there wasn't an internet. You did have Unix systems that would talk to each other, but they'd do a lot of things via, for example, SMTP, the same mail protocol we use today, uh, a simpler version of it back then. But essentially, uh, computers would dial up to each other and then transmit data to each other. But uh, over time, there's this need to actually send function calls across the network to other systems. And so we developed uh, protocols like RPC, uh, remote procedure calls. There were other protocols back there. This is the one that uh, most of us would be familiar with because it's still around today. Uh, but if you worked for IBM, for example, there are probably a dozen other protocols you could have used to send procedure calls across the network. Um, obviously, this was complicated. It's very technical. You had to really know what you're doing. So over time, we had other pro uh, products like uh, Corba and RMI, RMI being the Java protocol, if you're programming in Java. It's just a, a way to make function calls across the network. How to uh, say, I've got this function, I want to send some parameters, and I'll get a result back. So it's just like programming, but uh, the computer you're programming against is somewhere else. Yeah? Then the internet came along, changed everything. Yeah, and now we had computers that really needed to talk to each other. And we, had, uh, we moved from client-server to end-tier architectures, where you no longer just had your client, your server, you had your database, you had application layers. Uh, we didn't really have microservices back then. That was still to come. But uh, we still needed a more efficient way to communicate. So we had SOAP, the Simple Object Access Protocol, which is an XML-based protocol, uh, very, very powerful. But simple, it wasn't. SOAP is not a simple protocol at all. It has a nice feature, WSDL, which is a web description language that tells you what SOAP provides. It allows you to interrogate a SOAP service. It gives you a schema you can program against, which is absolutely fantastic, because now we have a nice set of requirements. Except in this day, uh, this day and age of fail fast, that doesn't really work, because you want to be able to update your code quickly. Now you've got the schema that all your clients are connecting to and using, and it doesn't really work that well. So SOAP is web services. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying SOAP isn't web services, but uh, more and more the fashion is to go for uh, uh, REST, uh, the representational state transfer, which is really just well, normally JSON over HTTP. It's actually anything over HTTP. But in most cases, it's JSON because most of the time, the client connecting to you is a web browser, and web browsers understand JSON. And actually, JSON is a really nice language. It's a lot easier to read. Oh, sorry, data representation, not a language. Uh, it's much easier to read than XML. So I think a lot of developers also prefer it. JSON is nice. And the kind of web services we're talking about today is going to be JSON over HTTP. Now, for proprietary reasons, we can't show you the actual applications we wrote, but we're just going to demonstrate how we did them. Yeah. But, uh, the short answer is, what are web services? Web services are really just web pages that applications can connect to and get data from. Oh, sorry, I skipped uh, one bit there about uh, Postel's principle. Uh, Postel's principle is the idea that you must be conservative in what you send out to people, but very accepting in what you receive. Uh, the problem is when you have lots of versions of clients, uh, especially if you've got things like cell phones connecting to your application, then you have very many different schemas connecting to you, uh, many different clients and versions and what they understand. So don't change what you're sending out too often, but when you're writing those clients, when you're accepting that data, or if you're a server accepting data from another server, be very uh, accepting in what you receive. Try and take in more than you need and then pick the bits that you, that you have. If you're in uh, network security, this is obviously the enemy because taking in more data means uh, holes that people can exploit. But when you're doing applications and you're doing communication data transfer, Postel's principle is actually a very useful principle to live by. Sorry about that. 
Right, so moving on, um, our first uh, web service or approach to web services was the more traditional approach, uh, which we used uh, Flask for. Um, this is something most of you will probably be familiar with. It looks like everyone here does some sort of um, web, uh, <laughs> web application development uh, here. Um, that is not necessarily our forte, but it is something we came across uh, recently, and uh, we'll show you why we used it and, and how we used it. Okay, so um, the problem statement um, that we encountered was that uh, one of our clients needed to integrate data from one of their native systems uh, with Frontierina via a web service that they had created. Uh, we did not have access to this, uh, to this um, web service during the development, and we needed to present a demo of some sort. So what did we need to do? We needed to create a dummy web service, um, which, create, uh, which um, showed some sort of data. Um, you know, we wanted to make it as... Uh, as, uh, as uh, close to the real thing as possible um, without, uh, without really just recreating what, <laughs> what the client had. So essentially we needed something very quick and, uh, and simple to learn um, that we could code very nice, uh, that we could code um, and uh, that solution we found was Flask. So that's what we used, Flask. Um, when I googled uh, web services or um, a web framework to use in Python, uh, Flask was one of the first to pop up. Uh, there were a number of other ones, Django, um, there was Pyramid, I think. Uh, there were a number of, a number of them, but uh, Flask seemed to be the, uh, the one that, uh, um, uh, uh, that, fits, that fits our purpose uh, perfectly, so that's the one I went with. Um, very simple. Um, Flask is a micro-framework. Um, with enough functionality to fit our requirements without being ridiculously difficult to learn. So that's why I chose it. Um, and uh, there's the documentation um, uh, URL there. Um, you can find everything there. It was fantastic. It really was very easy to set up as well. So I just went pip install flask. Wonderful. Um, and then I was able to use it by um, importing it as a library. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's flask. But, um, but uh, more importantly, how do I use, how do I use this Flask? Uh, let me just show you how simple it really is. So obviously we import the, we import the library um, with a couple of the classes that uh, are specified there. Then um, I went and uh, instantiated my object or my, um, my application object using the Flask uh, class. And then um, obviously uh, we wanted to, do, uh, wanted to display some uh, data um, uh, for each URL, so that uh, th these, this is each web, uh, this is the, um, the web service that, uh, that is called. So the first one is home. I just uh, wrapped that in. Uh, so Flask has this unbelievable wrapping mechanism um, uh, that uh, for, for each root. And uh, the first one is just your local host, um, your home page, let's say for instance. Um, so when I go into my home page, localhost 5000 or whatever it is, um, I will um, get the home function, uh, the home function will be called. And uh, that will display welcome to the home page of our simple web service. <laughs> um, the next one, if we actually want to do something in our, in our, um, in our, um, in our function or our, at our URL, we will go and get um, some data. Um, I've just uh, done some dummy data here, yeah, but it's not, uh, but it can be from a database some, or of some sort. Um, and, it, uh, and you can return that data in, in the JSON format by using JSONify. Obviously, this is a very simple, very simplistic way of doing things, but uh, there's more functionality that Flask provides, such as, um, such as get and post. So this is obviously a simple get uh, scenario, but um, you can also post uh, Post data over the over um, uh, using your um, your uh, your web URL, and that will that w uh, that you can pick up in your in your function too, and you can make use of that to call specific data from your database. So there's a whole bunch of functionality. This is very quick and easy to to code. Um, I was able to get this up and running in no time at all, and we could uh, demonstrate our demo quite nicely. So it was very nice. Um, in fact, why would you want to use anything else? But as you'll see, <laughs> and Matthew will come to this, 
there are reasons why you, won't be, you wouldn't be able to use Flask in all instances. All right, so I'll be talking about the second approach we used, uh, the, the, the harder approach, which in this case is building a web service from scratch. You don't have Flask, you don't have Pyramid, you don't have Django, uh, you don't have access to anything. Well, why does this happen? Uh, to understand this, you first of all need to understand the nature of open source and, well, the nature of large organizations. Yeah? While it's getting much better in large organizations, open source is um, still something large organizations don't really get uh, to grips with. Now, I'm talking generalizations here. Obviously, all organizations will have pockets of people who know open source, they understand open source, and they can do it well. But uh, by and large, especially in large corporate bureaucracies, you're going to keep bumping your head up against uh, the, these problems where open source is something that should be avoided at all cost. And like I said, it's getting better, but uh, we still see it happening. And it happens uh, pretty much across all spheres. It happens in big business. Uh, I personally have had a senior architect at uh, one of the organizations tell me they will never, ever use Linux. Uh, they now use Linux. I'm assuming that person no longer has a job. Uh, uh, dealing with governments, I mean, governments uh, has, especially in South Africa, um, has quite often come to the party and worked well with open source. But uh, yeah, you can't do tenders with open source, really. So uh, I think in a lot of places you find government doesn't like open source. Uh, and I know the CETA state uh, IT agency has also become a bit more hospital, uh, hostile towards open source. And then surprisingly also, even non-profits. A community that you think would be quite open to open source, it fits very much with the ethos, the, the idea of community. Uh, they're also often hostile to open source. There it's more just a question of support. Uh, a lot of time they don't have IT people on staff, they don't have technical people, so they just go to the closest vendor they can get, and that vendor all they know is, is Windows uh, and the software that they can sell. And so even non-profits quite often don't like working with open source. Okay. The other thing is uh, we find far too often, even today, and it's surprising that it does happen, and uh, it's kind of a generational thing. I think you'll find it happens more with older people than younger people. But a lot of people still confuse open source and shareware. They conflate the two. They see it as being like shareware, is something you download off the internet for free, but it can't be any good, and it's probably full of viruses. So we don't want to use open source because of that. Okay, so open source is problematic. Now, on top of this just open source uh, hate, we also have problems with infrastructure. And this is especially bad in large organizations. It's not a problem in small organizations. Uh, infrastructure is controlled by MORDAC. I don't know how many of you know MORDAC from Dilbert. MORDAC is the preventer of information services. His job is to make things secure, and he does that by making sure you can't do anything. It's a very effective strategy, and unfortunately, this is how most organizations approach the security. Okay, the security is typically lowest common denominator. You've got 10,000 users. You don't want to worry about five developers and what they might be doing. You've got to worry about the other 9,995 users who are going to do weird stuff on your network. And yes, I, I've done tech support before, and it's an educational experience. Yeah, if you've worked in IT, a computer is obvious, I and mean, it's easy. <laughs> not, not for everyone. All right, so when it comes to corporate security, they're quite often focusing on those people, the people who are not really sure what they're doing, and will quite happily email all your client's confidential records to their home server and maybe to their closest friend by accident. So a lot of security is focused on this. Um, also, just because the nature of large organizations, they tend to be Windows only. Uh, I'm sorry for you Microsoft employees, Windows is still not a Mac or Linux. Uh, I know we have Bash on Windows now. It's not quite the same. And on top of this, large organizations don't just give you Windows. It comes with its own extra special source. I put McAfee up here because it's the one that most of our clients use. But it's not always McAfee. It's always, it could be some other antivirus tool. And uh, sometimes more than one security tool. I actually have a problem on my current laptop where we have two competing security tools that are both arguing with each other. So my patches never get installed. This is a great way to enhance security is to have two security tools that prevent you installing anything so you can't update your security patches. Well done. All right, but this is the kind of uh, world that we live in. Okay. And of course, uh, because of this lowest common denominator uh, access, we don't have access, we don't have admin rights on the desktop. Getting admin rights can be a real process. Yeah? Um, it's also another illustrative example in security in large organizations. Uh, one organization I was working with, they, were, um, they got so obstructive and made it so difficult to get admin rights to do your work, eventually everyone got to know the domain admin password. Yeah. I mean, think about that. You're trying to clamp down the network, and so the only way people can do their work is to go and get the password that gives them access to everything. Yeah, you haven't solved your problem. You've made it 100 times worse. But yeah, so you don't have admin rights to your desktop. Doing things on your desktop is, is hard. 
And if you think getting access to the desktop is hard, getting access to the servers is even harder. Like now this time, uh, I will say that some of it makes sense. There's audit requirements. You can't just let anyone have access to servers. One of the biggest bank frauds in history was by someone who was both a techie and working in the trading system. And he allow, it allowed him to do a lot of trades against customers who didn't exist because he had access to the back end system so he could change things that weren't supposed to be changed. So having access to servers in uh, large uh, organizations is obviously a sensitive issue. You can't always go and do stuff yourself on the server. All right, so. Uh, you have a limited access to what you can do. Now, on top of all of this, as if it's not bad enough, you also have very restricted access to the internet. Yeah, uh, You'll notice a, a typo there, but it's not a typo. Uh, you have access, uh, internet access via proxy servers. They're not proxy servers. They're proxy servers using NTLM authentication, which a lot of open source tools uh, still don't support properly. Um, the servers are often unreliable. They're slow. Uh, they have huge hit lists of sites you're not allowed to visit. Uh, SourceForge is one particular favorite. I think every organization I've ever worked in blocks SourceForge. I don't know why, but it makes it enormous fun trying to download any software that I would like to use. Um, but yeah, getting anything off the internet is quite difficult. So the idea of doing pip install flask, <laughs> well, yeah, good luck with that. Right, it's going to be a huge effort to run that command and get it to actually work because you need that network access, you need access through the proxy. It can be done, I know how to do it, but boy, does it take a lot of work. All right. So what problem were we facing at this point? And it's uh, one of our clients. Uh, we were actually doing a code cleanup. Uh, we needed to delete a lot of code that wasn't being used. Um, we're using tools like Vulture. But a lot of the time, we don't know the entry points. We don't know what functions the clients are actually calling. Yeah, because of the way the nature of the application, uh, it uh, drops in and out of Python. So we need to track what modules are being called. Uh, and there's certain services. When they run them, we need to know what they're running and what parameters they're running. With. So we want to log this. Yeah? But we can't log it on their local machines because it's no use to anyone. We'd have to go and um, scan everyone's machines to find those logs. So we want to log them at a central server. It's a very simple application. It was just makes sense saying, someone did this at this time, and this is the person who did it. So we can ask them who did it. So it's not a lot of information. Yeah? It represents a low security risk. We're not storing passwords. We're not sending client data. Uh, user data is a bit, bit iffy. But you know what? If you've got that level of access to the network, yeah, you, uh, you've already uh, a security threat. So the data we're saying we're not too worried about. Uh, the service does need to respond quickly because the users are doing the day-to-day -day jobs. They don't want to have to sit there and wait 30 seconds for a website to update. But it's not huge throughput. We're not having thousands of these requests a second. So it's a fairly lightweight service, but it does need to respond quickly. Uh, the service needs to be installed on a server we don't have access to. And this particular client, we don't have access to any servers. Um, a server doesn't have Java, IIS, .NET, Apache. Uh, Docker doesn't have anything we could really use. But the one thing it does have is Python 2.7. Fantastic. So we've got Python 2.7, but we can't do a pip install flask. So we're going to have to find some other way to build a web server. Uh, and the clients that we connect to are Python based, which is cool. So actually, Python works for us. It says, so can we build a web server from scratch? OK, well, the first step is don't, because this is the internet age. You don't have to. Someone has done it for you already. So you don't need to actually go and do it. You can go into the internet search. And sure enough, uh, a gentleman by the name of Tal Liron has created a, sample a piece of sample code, which is a standalone uh, RESTful web service. And that's what I've used here. And it works brilliantly. All right. Uh, I've put here the entry point so you can see how it works. The, the core function that you're looking at here is base HTTP server, which is part of the core Python 2.7 libraries. So this comes installed with Python. You don't have to install anything else. A native Python install will have it and, and work the way you need it to. All right, and you can see the, other, the rest of those just blue code uh, just starting up the server and handling a keyboard interrupt when you need to shut it down. All right. Setting up the roots. The roots are stored as a simple dictionary, uh, a dictionary with regular expressions. All right, so you can now match a regular expression. Based on that regular expression, it will then return a file or handle a uh, look at the type of response that you're doing. And based on that response, it will call a function. So I've ex highlighted, for example, the function get records over here. So to determine the layout um, of your web services, very simple. Just edit this dictionary, uh, set, a, set it to the functions that you want to return data. And you're almost good to go. You just need to create the functions themselves. And I've just uh, copied the rest of the implementation. This comes straight out of the script. I've copied it verbatim as it is. It's not really necessary for a presentation. But I just want to show you that this is part of a bigger script. All right. 
And then finally, you just need to create the handlers. Now, this is uh, the demo script. Uh, obviously, our tool doesn't do this because we do a lot more work. We write stuff to file and logs. And because this is a long-running service, we have to close and open the files, uh, and make sure that they're instead open so that, uh, and also that we can recycle the log files because this thing, this thing runs for months at a time. So we don't want one log file for three months of data. Um, but in this example, we're just storing the data in memory in a simple dictionary called records. Uh, the get records method is the easiest. You just return the dictionary, and the API will turn it into JSON for you. So um, when you get an object back, it just returns JSON to the client. Uh, there's a get individual record handler. And this will be part of the problem we'll be talking about later, why you might not want to do this. You see that uh, the little clutch there to uh, take the URL, but we strip off bits of the URL to find uh, the data part that we're looking for, the query part of, of the get request. Yeah? So uh, we can return a particular key out of our list of records. We can add parameters into the data we're sending through. Uh, and then the last bit there is a set record, which is essentially a reverse of the get record, but also has to take a payload. They can pull the payload out. All right. The code is not terribly hard to understand, but you are starting to dig deeper into the bowels of uh, how a web service would work. You're starting to have to do a lot of things yourself. All right, and then creating the client. What's really nice about the script is at the top of the script, there's an example client which contains some Python code, so you don't have to remember how to write your REST clients. As in our world, we don't write a lot of REST stuff. We don't write a lot of web services. So it's nice to have this example out there. You can just pick it up start working with it, uh, and I must say it's, uh, it worked brilliantly. So as opposed to the week or two weeks of frustration I would have to deal with to get a pip install working, this, this web service took me about a morning to write and did everything I needed. All right. Okay, so let's compare the solutions. Right, so is this on mute? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so if we compare the solutions, um, obviously Flask is very, very simple. Um, but the problem is that the um, the problem is that you obviously have to do the external uh, library installation, uh, the pip install Flask, which, as Matthew says, at a big uh, bank or in a big organisation, sometimes that is not easy to get around. Um, also, it's a it can be black boxy a little bit. Um, so debugging very obscure issues can become a bit, of, uh, a bit tricky if you, um, if you haven't uh, read through the documentation um, fully. And I don't think anybody really does that. So, <laughs> you know, you only start reading the documentation when you require it. So that's, those are the two bit main disadvantages of Flask. Obviously, there are a few more, but I used this, uh, this um, application in a very um, um, simple way and a very um, limited, uh, in a limited fashion. So those are the two disadvantages that I could come up with. All right, now back to the, the raw Python, you developing something from uh, scratch. Well, first obvious problem is limited functionality. A lot of the URL functionality you get with something like Flask, a lot of the stuff that's built into it, you just don't get that. You're going to have to do it yourself. On top of that, your code has suddenly become a lot more complicated. As you saw from the example there, there's a lot of glue code. There's a lot of basic stuff that should be handled by any framework that you now have to do yourself. So you're writing a lot of code yourself. Um, it does help to really know what you're doing. Because again, you're now delving into the bowels of uh, RESTful web services. Fortunately, uh, I think most of us here have been uh, programming a while. HTTP is a pretty s a simple service. We understand how it works. Um, and request response is something that we mostly understand these days. It certainly wasn't the case uh, many years ago. But I think these days, uh, a lot of us do understand how it works. But it really does help to understand. Obviously, you also have uh, functions that can pretty much do anything. anything you can get anything, do anything. So you Got to start worrying about security, uh, URL injection, people sticking weird things in URLs, um, you possibly creating huge security holes. In our particular application, we're reading and writing to the, the local server's hard drive. Um, if someone else gets access to our server and does something strange, they could probably uh, get content off, our, off that server's hard drive. Uh, I'm actually not too concerned about that. Sorry, I did men didn't mention the first slide. The other thing that uh, these large organizations often have is IE6, Internet Explorer 6. So when they tell me they have security concerns and I see they're still running uh, IE6, I don't take them that seriously anymore. But yeah, do think about security. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and then obviously the last thing is you don't have the scalability uh, infrastructure. You don't have all those built-in hooks and things that allow you to expand this horizontally or vertically. If you want to do that, you're going to have to do it yourself. Yeah, so you, you can't really scale this. And the other thing is you've got that one dictionary that is your routing. If this application starts to get quite large, it's also going to become quite unmanageable. 
And in fact, if you keep hacking at it, you're basically going to end up with Flask. So uh, this is uh, probably better for smaller websites that you want to create. So now we move on to the advantages. And uh, for Flask, there's many. <laughs> um, for my purposes, so um, when when you install uh, when you install Flask, you have a fully uh, featured uh, um, set of web services. I mean, you can use it for just about anything. It's it's uh, it really was simple simple to install and uh, and simple to use. Plenty of documentation, so it's easy to learn. It's Pythonic. <laughs> Matthew told me to put that in. <laughs> Um, so that I, I suppose that means that it's uh, it's very simple to um, uh, to code. It's beautiful. It's uh, it's um, uh, it's it's logical. <laughs> um, and then uh, obviously, as I said before, it's uh, very extendable. So you can use it for uh, many. Uh, you can you can just um, scale it up and down as much as you, uh, as as far as you want to go. So you can uh, so you can um, put in a number of uh, new uh, um, URLs and uh, and uh, extend it as as far as as far as you want to go. Okay, well, uh, the raw Python does have advantages, as we saw. There are reasons you want to use it. Obviously, you don't have those uh, dependencies. You don't need other things to be installed. You don't need uh, complex configuration to get it working. It's very lightweight. It's essentially one Python script. So if you're writing a little app on a Raspberry Pi and you're worried about memory constraints, this might be a way to go. Uh, actually, the amount of memory we have on these devices these days is uh, phenomenal, so you don't really need to worry about that. But yeah, if you're worried about uh, size constraints uh, or performance, this might give you some advantages. Uh, security is easy to control. Now, bear in mind I said that you've got to worry about security because you don't have anything that's in there. But also, you've got a limited number of entry points as ways people can hack the system. So you do have a better focus on where your potential security threats or your security vectors are. So you do have more control of your security, but once again, you need to understand what you're doing. Don't give people access to your server. And then finally, it is flexible, which is not the same as extensible. Flexible in this case means that if you're dealing with something, uh, some web client that has got a hokey protocol and sends weird binary characters or isn't quite HTTP the way we know it, this actually allows you to get into the guts of the system and handle those strange requests and uh, respond to them better. So I can see quite a few scenarios where you've got some very badly behaving clients and you need to be able to sort them out. Then a solution like this where you write it from scratch is actually quite feasible and will make your life easier. All right. And finally, we come to the conclusion. Um, so obviously, uh, Matthew has mentioned um, creating REST for web services in, in Python is actually very easy, as you could see uh, by our two approaches, um, even when the client makes it difficult. Um, when creating web services, Python has many, many options. Uh, it's not just limited to the two web uh, approaches to the web service that we uh, will, uh, we uh, talked about today. It also um, has many other options. Perma, Django mentioned that before. Uh, we also um, so today we actually only mentioned two of the simpler choices, um, but uh, but they were quite uh, but they were quite effective in what we were trying to achieve. So. Um, yes, if you guys are interested and uh, you haven't done it before, please get started today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much again. Uh, before we go to into any questions, I'll remind you that we have an open space for Python in Africa in FOIA. So if you're interested, you can join. But we'll take a few questions if there are any. Have you looked at a framework like um, Bottle, which is a single Python file designed to be a single Python file with no dependencies outside of the standard library? Uh, looks like exactly what you're trying to build with the web framework from scratch. Yeah, no, I never investigated that further because, like I said, I went into Google. I said how to create a web service. If Bottle had been number one on my list, I would probably be talking about Bottle today. <laughs> Again, it's just a single script. It's actually very simple, um, and I don't need any more functionality than that in, for this particular use case. Uh, I assume if Bottle is a framework, it does have a lot of the extra functionality that we're missing in this example. Thanks a lot. I think you guys uh, showed some 
quite creative thinking and <laughs> working around some of the limitations you met. Um, something I found difficult, particularly with RESTful web services, is actually much more around the API design process. Mm -hmm. How did you find that working with clients with varying degrees of sophistication? Uh, and how did you navigate that a bit? Or was the API completely under your control and you guys could do what you like? Uh, I think in both cases, well, in, in the one case, the API was already predetermined by the developers. Uh, in, in the other case, it was completely under our control. Um, I, I must say, in my experience with other web services, I haven't found that to be too much of an issue, but that's because most of it is the CRUD stuff. So you're creating records, updating records, deleting records. So you, there's not really a lot of hard detail in the API. Um, in the world we live in, data is often the far bigger problem. The structure of the data, you know, is it, is it name or is it first name, surname? Do you want to put a middle name field in there? These kind of questions can occupy you for weeks at a time. So we just pass lots of large JSON objects around, and it's really the contents of those JSON objects that occupies most of our time. Yeah. Sorry, wait for the microphone. <laughs> so in particular, I'm thinking about stuff like what are the abstractions that you embed in the API? Like, do you put uh, an identifier in your path? So you have like a slash people slash ID path? Or is that the sort of thing that you're always going to be putting into your JSON? Uh, that is typically the way we would, uh, well, I would build web services, not, not we. But uh, when I'm building web services, that sort of URL mechanism is what I use. So I normally use something like the, the class, so people slash and then an identifier, something like that. But it doesn't always work that, uh, that way. Um, obviously, you often have functionality where you're doing, uh, for example, huge transactions, and you're passing a lot of data. Um, there, I try to do things by verb. So you, you organize it by, I'm doing something. And then I normally have a separate section of the hierarchy for that. But again, like I say, we don't build a lot of web servers. And these two examples, the, the routings we had, were very simple. It's like log task, log instantiation. That was it. We didn't have to do much more than that. So you said you didn't have access to the box. Uh, can you just go through like the deployment process? And then you <laughs> Please copy this file to directory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the deployment process, <laughs> honest. Okay, so one thing we, one other thing we did have is uh, they exposed uh, via, okay, so running on a Solaris box, exposed via Samba shares. So just give you an idea of what we're working with here. Um, but the logs were actually exposed via Samba shares. So we could see the logs. Uh, you mentioned that there were quite a few barriers to using uh, in big companies and organizations to mm -hmm. using open source software. Do you find those same barriers with Python since Python itself is open source? Uh, yes, um, just any, when people, when you talk to people about Python, and bear in mind in the corporate sphere, a lot of people, they understand Microsoft, they understand IBM, um, more and more they understand Google. But uh, things like programming languages, if it's not .NET um, or maybe Java, they pretty much haven't heard of it. So when you're talking about Python, what is it? Oh, it's an open source programming language. Oh, no, we don't do that. So. Uh, and like I said, it's very dependent on who you're talking to. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm describing organizations as huge monoliths, but obviously they're made up of lots of individuals. And sometimes you'll hit those individuals who really know what they're doing and say, oh, Python, fantastic. We think it's an awesome idea. Go ahead, do it. So you will hit those people. But often you end up dealing with uh, um, architects or security people. So no, no, we can't do that. And I'd also to give you an idea of the scale of the problem. Um, I was working in another bank uh, with their security team. Uh, I wasn't actually doing security stuff, I was just helping them with the, our application and what we were doing with it. But they expressed their frustration to me about how even though they're in charge of security and they've got to monitor and implement and manage security, the networks team doesn't talk to them and ignores them most of the time. So you not only do you have this hostility to open source, you actually have this hostility between departments and between ideas. So uh, working in that kind of environment, you have to become quite an expert at navigating the politics and the, the relationships between people. But like I said, sometimes you hit people um, who really know what they're doing, they're really passionate about it, and they're really keen for you to go ahead and do it. And then it works brilliantly because they've got all the tools. I worked at another bank where they were doing Java development, not, not Python. 
but they had all the repositories on their local network. So you wanted to do Maven installs, like a, a pip install. You couldn't get out the network, but you didn't need to because you had a, your own local repository, so you could install everything you needed. So I'm just uh, interested, uh, in, in, in addition to um, using Python for the web services, mm -hmm. what other practical uses do you use Python for within your organization? Okay, well, bearing in mind it's uh, not our organization as such. Um, we, it's our clients. We're mostly talking about our clients here. Um, internally, our organization, though, we also don't use a lot of Python. It's this particular product suite that uses Python. Um, in the nature of all large organizations, uh, uh, Front Arena was actually acquired by acquisition about 15 years ago. So when it was originally developed, it had Python, but uh, other parts of the organization use Java, other parts use uh, .NET. Uh, and I think any large organization, you're going to find that. Um, I always like to use the example of Deutsche Bank. Uh, when I dealt with them, you, uh, well, when I was trying to uh, acquire software, any software vendor comes to you know, we're installed at Deutsche Bank. I reached the conclusion that any software is installed at Deutsche Bank. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of big organizations like that. They're using lots of different um, sources. For our clients uh, and for the stuff that we're doing, because we use Python, rather stick to using Python. So we use Python, for example, for building deploy tools, security checking, uh, rolling out uh, data changes. So a lot of the glue code that we create, we do in Python because it's the language that we have available to us. But it's a great language for doing it. So why use anything else? Okay, the last question. No more after this. Um, hello. Connection to databases. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it also requires a lot of libraries to be installed. How do you get around that? Okay, well, in this case, this application, I think in both cases, we didn't require databases. Um, and yes, that is very much a very real problem. If you want to connect, whether it's Postgres, Oracle, or SQL Server, you're going to have to install some libraries somewhere. Uh, but the kind of applications we're dealing with, uh, we never actually talk to a database directly. We're always going via an abstraction layer that does the database stuff for us. So in our world, we never have to talk to databases. And for our logging, we're just writing straight to the file system. So the file system was our database. But yeah, if you're connecting to databases, uh, I think that's a whole other talk because then you're talking about um, cache management, your, your connection management, pooling, all of this kind of stuff. That's a talk in itself. Yeah, we just work on a, or like a Matthew and I particularly, we work on a, a system called Fronterina. And that, uh, that um, has, it has the, like the database is sort of like um, yeah. sits below well, a service, yeah. The, the database is SQL Server or Sybase, yeah. but we have an abstraction layer that yeah. connects us to it. Okay. So we access the data through Python. That's how we do it. Yeah. Thank you. Please feel free to join another talk. Thank you.